This man was a super patriot, but not the greatest prophet. He's known as the running prophet. He wasn't really the man that we might think he was in a lot of ways as we read the book. But what we do know is this man played an important role in God's plan. In fact, this man did something that's never happened to anybody else in the Bible. Did you know this man had the single greatest response that's ever recorded in Scripture? Do you know yet who we're talking about? If we said he was swallowed by a big fish, would you then know? We welcome you to our study of the book of Jonah. Today, we're going to be thinking about the old prophet Jonah, the great running prophet, the super patriot, and Jonah's message, among other things, forever teaches that prejudice and racism are against the will of God. Stay tuned as we're going to study this powerful book. To destroy the works of the evil one, and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective Play Stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. The book of Jonah shows God's love for the nations and how God wants these nations to be saved. What do we know a little bit? What do we know about Jonah himself? But Jonah, apart from being mentioned in the book of Jonah, he's also called a, a prophet of comfort to the northern kingdom of Israel, mentioned during the reign of Jeroboam II. Somewhere between 790 and 750 BC, he's mentioned in 2 Kings 14, verses 25 through 27. He would have been a contemporary along with two other minor prophets, Amos and Hosea. Jonah's name means a dove, and he's often thought of as a super patriot, but a rather reluctant prophet. You see, Jonah, he hated the Assyrians, and he hated that capital city of Nineveh. And you remember God said, Jonah 1 verse 2, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city, 
cry out to Nineveh, give them a chance to make it right. And, and that didn't settle well with Jonah. God told him to go to Nineveh. He got on a boat, went the opposite way. Why did Jonah hate Nineveh so much? Well, maybe if we put ourselves in Jonah's shoes, we might understand it a little better. Assyria was the nation God used to punish his people Israel, mentioned in 2 Kings 17, verses 7 through 8. God spoke of their king as the rod of my anger against Israel. Isaiah chapter 10, verse number 5. That powerful nation Assyria, of which Nineveh was its capital city, would eventually carry God's people away captive in 721 BC. And so the Israelites and the Assyrians were arch enemies with great resentment and hatred for each other. You can imagine maybe Jonah knew some people, maybe close friends, maybe even some of his family had been killed or taken in captivity by Assyria. They came over as terrorists in essence and destroyed the nation of Israel, and everything Jonah loved, everything he stood for, what in his mind represented God, they took all that away. And so you can imagine, this is a message of a prophet of God literally going to preach to his enemies and loving his enemies. And so it'd be very hard for Jonah to stomach that. Now, here's some keys to the book of Jonah that help us to understand it. Probably the key word in the book of Jonah is the word repentance. Go to Nineveh, that great city. God says, cry out against it. God's message in the book of Jonah is a message of repentance for Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. Key verse, Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, as we mentioned, God said, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, the idea that God wants to get across is that he loves all people and that he wants the Assyrians to be saved. One of the key phrases in the book is found in chapter 3, verse 8. God says through Jonah, let everyone, every one of these Ninevites, let everyone turn from his evil way. And so what's the message? God wants all men just like it's always been. God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so that's God's message through Jonah. Now, here's a, a real easy way to remember the book of Jonah. Here's an outline of Jonah. Chapter one, Jonah is running from God. God says, I want you to go cry out against Nineveh. And Jonah says, I hate those people in essence. He got on a ship and went the exact opposite way. In the process, the ship came upon a great storm. They realized it was Jonah's fault. They throw Jonah overboard. Jonah ends up in the belly of that great fish. And now in chapter two, Jonah in the bottom of the ocean in the belly of that great fish finally gets right and decides to run to God. And so Jonah is first running from God. Chapter two, his mind gets right and he comes out of the belly of that fish running to God. Chapter three. Jonah's running with God, doing exactly what God wants him to do. He goes to Nineveh, gets out on that beach, and what a spectacle that must have been. And he runs into town, tells everybody about the message of God. And then chapter 4, sadly, Jonah starts running ahead of God. He went and preached. The Ninevites repented. Jonah got angry about it. Now he's running out ahead of God. So that's kind of the, the layout of the book of Jonah. Now let's think a little bit about Jonah, and we're going to mention Nahum a little bit later because Nahum is a sad update on the Ninevites 125 years later. But here's some of the messages that God teaches us from the book of Jonah. Number one, you can't run from your responsibility to God. Listen to Jonah chapter one, verse number three with me. The Bible says, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. How'd that work out for Jonah? How did running from his responsibility to God work out? Well, you remember how it worked out. 
Jonah ended up in the bottom of the ocean in the belly of a great fish, and he's eventually vomited up on the sea. It didn't work out at all. Jonah paid the price for his sin, and so will people who live in sin as well. Do you remember Jonah 1 verse 3? Jonah paid the fare, and he went the opposite way. Friend, people who live in sin and decide not to do God's will, to shirk their responsibility, there's always a fare or a price to be paid for sin. Romans 6.23 tells us what that is. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, one's life, people's lives are often in great turmoil when they shirk their responsibility or fail to do God's will. Think about what happened to Jonah when he shirked that. Think about the, 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 the scene of events that unfolds. Jonah decides, nope, I hate those Ninevites. They're our arch enemies. They've killed some of them, my friends and family. They've destroyed Israel. I'm not going to preach into our enemies. And so Jonah goes the opposite way. Everybody on the ship is in a great storm because of that. They have to throw the cargo over. Uh, they have to deal with eventually throwing Jonah over. Jonah ends up in the belly of a great fish. And can you imagine what that must have been like? He's at the bottom of the ocean, it seems like. And he finally comes to his senses, eventually vomited up on the sea by that great fish. Think about how Jonah's life is in turmoil when he shirks his responsibility to do what God wants him to do. And then let's make it practical. Let's think about our lives. What about my life and yours? How much turmoil and problems do we create for ourselves when we fail to do God's will? When I know I ought to seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, and I put everything else before that, the turmoil, the problems, the sin, the, the difficulty that creates in my life, all of us can realize that. When I know that I need to obey Jesus and obey God's word, and I put other things in place, the, the sin, the turmoil, the heartache that comes into that, this is such a powerful lesson that we learn from the book of Jonah about how problems are, we create problems for ourselves when we fail to obey the will of God. Let's consider a few other practical truths from the book of Jonah. When Jonah is cast overboard, storm settles down, he's cast overboard, finds himself in the belly of that great fish. You know what Jonah realized? I need, to, I need to seek God for help. Jonah turned to God in prayer. And as you read chapter two, Jonah basically prays a prayer to God for the difficult situation that he's in. And there's some really unique language about how Jonah feels in that situation. And Jonah, he's eventually cast out of the belly of that great whale. From when I find myself in difficulty and turmoil like Jonah did, I need to turn to God in repentance and change my ways. Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and never lose heart. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, it overcomes much. This is why we pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, this is why we come boldly to the throne of grace. This is exactly what Jonah did. Jonah came boldly to the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help in his time of need. And friend, that's what we do today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 16. Another practical lesson that we learn from the book of Jonah is this. We need to preach the preaching that God tells us. I love Jonah chapter 3. When Jonah comes out, on that beach, after being vomited out of the belly of a whale, Jonah gets the point of the great fish. And look what is said in verse number two. Here's God's message to Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message I tell you. You know what Jonah didn't do this time? He didn't go the opposite way. Jonah got to running with God, and he went to Nineveh, and he preached the message of God. Friend, as Christians, we need to have the courage, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when we may not necessarily approve of or like the way people live their lives and treat us. 
We need to realize it's the message of God that'll turn all that around. The, the Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, preach the word. 1 Peter 4, 11, speak as the oracles of God. Paul said, I've not shunned to declare to you uh, the whole counsel of God. Acts 20, verse 28, I kept back nothing that was helpful. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces heart, it hearts, it changes minds, it, it redirects the course of people's lives, it makes enemies into friends, it makes people who were once haters of God, lovers of God. And so if people are going to be saved, if things are going to be changed, if, if good's going to be done, like Jonah, we need the, uh, the import, we need to realize the power of preaching the gospel of God. Now, I want to show you an ironic thing in the book of Jonah that is often overlooked. Why is it? Jonah goes into Nineveh, he preaches a hard message uh, in so many days. God's going to destroy you if you don't repent and get right. And everybody responded. Greatest single response ever recorded in all of Scripture. Why'd they do that? Well, see, here's the irony of it. The people of Nineveh, they worshipped an idol called Dagon. Dagon was the fish god. Uh, statues and images that we have found from that era, it's a half-man half fish looking idol it was their main deity everything they did was based on that and so here's what's interesting to the people who worship the fish god god sent a man out of the mouth of a fish to preach to them about the true god and no wonder there was a hundred percent conversion rate Jonah coming out of the mouth of that great fish. Friend, that wasn't just something that was done in a corner. Here are these people who worship this fish God, and God sends a man out of a fish. The true and living God now sends a man out of the mouth of a fish to preach the message of God to those people. They realized this is the true and living God. He's greater than a half man, half God fish. He's true God. And we need to follow him in every way. Now, what message do we also learn from the book of Jonah? Friend, we learn that God commands all men everywhere to repent of their wickedness. Listen to the harsh message. Look in Jonah chapter 3, and I want you to hear the message of Jonah. Jonah 3 verse 3. So Jonah rose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. The Bible says, now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. He cried out and said, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. The word came to the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way, from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their work, that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Here you see both the message of repentance, and you see the long suffering and the pity of God. Jonah says, 40 days, you better get it all together, make, your, make everything right, get your house in order, 40 days, Nineveh's going to be destroyed. And people knew about Jonah, and they said, we better listen to this guy. And so from the king down, they all changed their ways. They repented and listened to the long suffering of God. God saw they changed their ways. He did not bring upon them the disaster he said he would. Lamentations 3, verse 20 and 21. This reminds me of the mercy of God. Through the Lord's mercies, we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is God's long suffering toward us. And yet, you would think Jonah 
would have been really happy about this. And yet Jonah had a serious problem of prejudice against these people. Watch what Jonah does. Jonah 4 verse 1. Look at the very next verse. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Why did Jonah get so angry at these people? That's how prejudiced, that's how racist, and that's how it offended Jonah that these people... What did Jonah want to happen to the Ninevites and the Syrians? He wanted God. In 40 days, it would have been one of the best days Jonah had ever seen if God had destroyed Nineveh. He was probably looking forward to that. And yet when that didn't happen and God forgave them, Jonah got exceedingly mad. He wanted those people to die and go and be lost. My friend, prejudice, racism, not wanting people to turn from their evil ways and get right, that's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to be a people of true repentance in every way. And so God eventually will teach Jonah what's right, how to act, and Jonah learns the lesson from that as well. Now let's consider for just a few moments the update. The, the update 125 years later about what happened to Nineveh after they repented. And so Nineveh repented. Everybody got right. For a period of time, they lived good. But 125 years later, they're back in the same spot. The book of Nahum is a companion book to the book of Jonah. It was written 125 years after Jonah, and Nahum now tells of the pending destruction of Nineveh for their backsliding and continuing in a life of sin. Just as was promised by God, Nineveh fell in 606. And so here are the messages that we learn from the book of Nahum. God gives people time to repent, but God's not going to acquit those who choose not to. Nahum 1 verse 3, God will not at all acquit the wicked. We have a process today where presidents can pardon people who are definitely guilty of crimes, and that's within our law and the way we do things, but that's not the way God works. If someone's guilty and they choose not to repent and make that right, God is not at all going to acquit the wicked. Wicked people are not going to escape punishment because they get pardoned on the day of judgment. That's not the way it works. Nahum 1 verse 3 tells us that. God's power is seen also in beautiful terms in the second part of Nahum 1. Look at Nahum chapter 1, and I want you to notice what God says in Nahum chapter 1. Notice, if you would, verse number 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. He will not at all acquit the wicked. Listen to this. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And listen to this phrase. The clouds are the dust of his feet. The power of God. He, he controls the whirlwind, the tornado, and the storm. Who's behind that? The Almighty. How powerful is he? The clouds are like the dust of his feet. Isn't that a beautiful picture of the power of God? Now, we know that God's not going to acquit the wicked, but here's what we also know. From the book of Nahum, God tells us he is a refuge for the right in a time of trouble. Look at Nahum chapter 1, verse number 7. The Bible says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. People who do right and follow God, they can run to God. They can see God in that and have the hope and joy of living with God forever. He's going to be their source of stronghold in everything that they do. Now, let me show you just one other passage from the book of Nahum. You know, when we, when we think of the minor prophets, we usually think about uh, books that are hard messages to Israel. But what's interesting is the book of Nahum is quoted in a beautiful way tied into the preaching of the good news of Jesus. Look at Nahum chapter 1, and notice what the Bible says in Nahum chapter 1, verse number 15. The scripture says, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. Nahum says, O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. And so there's this picture. Look up on the mountains. 
Here come the feet of somebody bringing good news, gospel, the peace. Romans 10 verse 15 quotes this verse. How precious are the feet of those who bring good tidings of glad things. And so Nahum is a, it's a message to Nineveh and Assyria that it's, they haven't repented. They're continuing in their way. God's going to make sure that their day comes. And if, that although they're given opportunity, sadly, they didn't take the opportunity this time like they did in the book of Jonah. And so while God gives men time, that time eventually will run out. Friend, here's what we think about today. From the book of Jonah, we learn that God loves all people. God wants all men, regardless of nationality, regardless of race, regardless of how evil or wicked they may have been, God wants all men to hear the message of the gospel and be saved. He wants us, Christians, his servants, to take that message and not to despise taking the message even to people who are living immorally or who may be enemies of God and enemies of Christians. We got to have a, we, we need to take that message with the right heart and the right attitude. And when people repent and turn to God, that ought to bring great joy into our life and theirs. But friend, the message is also this. God gives people time. There was 125 years between Jonah and Nahum. They had time to live right, get right, teach their children how to act right, and yet they fell back into some of the same old habits. They didn't turn to God this time, and they were destroyed. And so there is a day of reckoning coming. Friend, if you're not a child of God, we urge you to become one. Acts 18, 8, the Bible says, many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Would you repent of sin and be baptized for the remission of your sins? Acts 2, 38, if you are a Christian, then friend, let's each of us be motivated by the power from these two books to share the gospel with the lost. It's the only way people can really be changed. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more from God's Word. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.